right, good morning slash afternoon, depending on when you're watching this. If you are watching this, it is because uh, my wife, Ing, and I are at the hospital currently pushing out a baby. Well, she's pushing out the baby. I'm supporting her. So uh, it's exciting. Please pray for us. I'm sorry that I can't be here this morning, but, uh, uh, well, that's why our good friend Stephen, uh, part of our, our tech team, is here to, uh, to help record. So uh, praise God for that and give him a thanks. Um, speaking of thanks, let's, uh, let's give thanks, uh, to God. Let's, uh, start in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, I give you thanks for this morning and for this day. I pray that, uh, as my brothers and sisters are listening to this message, that they'll be attentive, Father God, that, uh, you will speak to our hearts, that you will convict us, Lord, of sin and of making things the way that we want them to be, Lord. But I pray that you will give us a clear, uh, message to our hearts that you are the one that is in charge of all things, that you are the one that wants it your way, Lord. So I pray that you will have your way among us this morning. We give you thanks for this word in Acts 7 this morning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, this year, you may not know, but we are actually observing a 500-year anniversary. Yes, a 500-year anniversary of something known as the Reformation. You might have heard of it. It's a kind of a big deal, especially amongst us as Protestants or Protestants. And it started back with a German, good German, by the name of Martin Luther, who uh, at the time, the church, the Catholic church, was uh, getting itself into some corruption. Uh, There was a whole lot of lead up and there were many factors to what was going on. But Martin Luther was one who had studied the scriptures in their original language and realized that there was something very off about what Christians were doing, what the church was doing and how it was conducting itself. So he named 95, and it was called the 95 Thesis, uh, uh, different errors that uh, the church was in, and he nailed them to the door publicly so everybody can see this, right? One of the biggest, one of the biggest uh, things that, that the Catholic Church had gotten itself involved in was the selling of something called indulgences. You see, in that time, the Catholic Church was saying, well, you know, in order to uh, truly worship God and, and, and find salvation. Yes, it's through Christ alone. However, there are still temporal punishments. In other words, the things that you get involved in here on earth, you still have to pay uh, the consequences of it, but you can get out of it. And one of the ways is to show penance or some sort of contrite heart. And one of the ways to do that was through a work known as tithing. So they would have a special tithe and say, you know, if you were to just give, you can kind of give your way out of a punishment. Sounded like a good idea at the time, right? So by doing this, after a while, they realized, hey, we're we're actually making a lot of money. We can fund a lot of different projects, uh, including wars and and defenses and building projects and all of these things that, that the Catholic Church had its hand in at that time. Now, obviously, this is a corruption of power. And Martin Luther was the first to, to wasn't one, he was one of the first, he wasn't the first to notice this, but he was very bold in, in, basically going to, uh, to the Pope and going to the public and saying, hey, this is wrong, we're in error, we need to change our ways, and we need to look at what Scripture actually says. Now, how do you think the Catholic Church felt about that? Well, at the time, they didn't like it. In fact, the Pope in Rome was scathing uh, mad at Martin Luther and wanted him silenced completely, even dead. The idea here was that the Catholic Church had built a system at the time, a system of security, a system of predictability, a way that they can say, hey, this is our system and everything is going well for us. But what happened was Martin Luther came and shook it and tested it and said, is this really what God is doing in the world? And he brought it back to God and says, hey, actually there's a lot more to the story than this. You built a system of security. And that's not what God is about necessarily. He's about getting people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so uh, in the same way, many of us Christians today, that is why, by the way, we are called Protestants or Protestants because Martin Luther protested what the Catholic Church was doing and all of his followers were then Protestants or Protestants. So now you may have some Catholics in your family and you may have some Protestants in your family. That's why the Protestants protest what the Catholics were doing. Now, today, the church, the church of, the, of the West and the East, the Eastern Orthodox, another branch, and the Catholics and the Protestants, we're all getting along, we're all dialoguing just nice. Yes, they're all, you know, yes, it's by faith alone, we understand that. 
But the idea here uh, in this illustration and in this story is that the church wanted to have it its own way. Because if we can fit God into a box, we can just do whatever we want freely. We're going to talk a lot about this today. And we're going to see this principle illustrated in Acts chapter 7. Because the very first martyr that we see for Jesus, the very first person to die for his faith, Stephen, uh, arrives here in Acts chapter 7. No, not Stephen, who's currently behind the tech, uh, the, the tech booth uh, over here. But this is Stephen the martyr. So open up to Acts chapter 7. We're going to find what happens when we start to build systems, why we do it. Stephen calls that out, how we do it and how we can protect ourselves and who it is that frees us of these systems. So open up to Acts chapter 7. Yes, I am going to read this whole passage. Uh, I invite you to open it up uh, where you are right now, and we're going to read through it together. Acts chapter 7. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these charges true? Stephen was just brought in and charged with a few different things. Uh, one of the things which was he was uh, disgracing the temple. He was basically saying, hey, the temple, you know, uh, this thing's going to be desecrated according to Jesus, but God is everywhere, etc. And the second thing that uh, he was uh, accused of was blaspheming the law of Moses. Now, some of these were lies. Keep that in mind as we're reading through this, because Stephen himself was not for that. But uh, let's see indeed what his reply was. The, the high priest says to Stephen, are these charges true? To this, verse 2, he replied, Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to the land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. They will punish, uh, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said. And afterward, they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of the twelve patriarchs. So, so far, he's setting up their history for them. He's saying, hey, let me tell you, let's go back in time and let's talk about it from the very beginning. God moved our father Abraham. He moved Isaac and Jacob around, right? And this is where we started. There's the 12 tribes right here. Verse 9, he says, Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering to our ancestors, could, uh, and our ancestors could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought out from the sons of Hamor and Shechem for a certain sum of money. Verse 17, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, he had a number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Basically, they forgot about Joseph, these Egyptians. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to follow uh, by forcing them to throw their newborn babies so that they would die. Basically, they would leave them out for uh, exposure to die to the weather. That was what the order was. At that time, Moses was born, and he had no ordinary child. And he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for by his family. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech, uh, and action. 
When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his own people, the Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you're brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, now he's 80 years old, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near, the Mount, near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight as he went over to get a closer look. He heard the Lord say, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses, and this is the Moses who they were talking about, by the way, who these, uh, who these chief priests and, and this religious community was angry at Stephen about shaking everybody. This was the Moses, the same Moses, right, who gave the law. This is the same Moses they had rejected with the words, who made you ruler and judge? He was sent to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and performed wonders and signs in Egypt and the, uh, at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the wilderness. This is the Moses who told the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly of the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and, our, uh, and with our ancestors, and he received living words to pass on to us. He is acknowledging, yes, these are the words of Moses indeed. But our ancestors, verse 39, but our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and revealed in what, uh, and reveled in what their own hands had made. But God turned away from them and gave them over to worship of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The, this agrees with what was written in the book of the prophets. Did you, did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have taken up the tabernacle of Molech, is another god, and the star of your god, Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our ancestors, Stephen continues, had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It was made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them, and they took the land from uh, the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place in the, uh, for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet says, my throne is in heaven and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or will, be my resting, uh, or will be my resting place be? Where will be my resting place? He uh, has not my hand made all these things. You stiff-necked people... Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are like, just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. There were two things, again, that they accused Stephen of, and he answers both in this very long passage. One, they said, you blaspheme this holy place. He was at the temple. The temple was everything 
to these religious leaders. The temple was the economic center, the educational center, the governmental center. It was every branch of the government to them. It was everything. And to blaspheme took great offense. They were shook. Okay, that seems to be the word that we're using. They were shook quite deeply because they heard about this gospel that was going around about Jesus. They did not like what they were saying, what Jesus was saying, that, hey, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it. The temple was everything. That's what they knew. That is what they lived off of. That was their lifestyle. In order to change, that would mean everything. They would have to change their whole worldview. It was a threat to their authority. The second thing was the law of Moses, and that was something that they claimed to know quite dearly. And so when they came to Stephen, they said, you don't know huh? This man here, this man, you don't even know, this man's trying to destroy the temple. Hey, that would destroy our whole system, everybody. And the second thing was, and the law. He speaks against the law. Who knows the law? We know the law. All right, I think we know God pretty well. And what Stephen does in his speech here is, if you were to look through again, you notice all the places. He's like, okay, you want to talk about a place? First off, God did not start here at the temple. He called our ancestor from a foreign land somewhere else and said, follow after me. And he went with him everywhere. It was about God's promise. It wasn't about a place. He said, I'll give you a place. I will be the one that gives you security. But at the time, these religious leaders accusing Stephen said, no, we don't like this. Why? Because it threatened their security. But yet, as Stephen is going through in his polemic, he's saying again and again, God is the one that gives us security. God is the one that gives us all things, not a particular place. And the second thing he addresses is the law of Moses. He says again and again, people didn't want to listen to Moses. They didn't want to listen to each prophet that said, turn back to God. Indeed, their hearts were still, tor uh, still, still turned towards Egypt. They were still turned towards other things. And that's why at the end, when he finally addresses them directly and says, look, what I'm trying to say, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised, is that you will not turn back towards God. You want to say, oh, I'll set up all these religious rules and I'll follow them to the T, but I'm not actually looking to God. I'm just looking to fulfill whatever it is in my own life that gives me security. That's what Stephen addresses. From the beginning, we were meant to be with God. Back in Genesis, the very first sin that was committed was the accepting that we, we can be, uh, the accepting of a lie that we could be more than who God made us to be, but that we could be God ourselves. And that's evidenced even in the Tower of Babel if you were to go forward in Genesis. You see, the human heart has already this sense of insecurity because of sin that is in us. And we want to continue to try to build security in our lives through various means. Why do you think there's shame about nakedness? We're insecure. We're insecure people because we are detached from who we should be with, and that's God. So there's this shame that we have about our nakedness that we found in Genesis, right? If we were to go back, that the man and woman were, were suddenly ashamed of being naked once sin entered the world. There's these insecurities, that entered into us with sin because we are detached from our home with God, if that makes sense. So what the religious leaders were seeking to do was if we, if we somehow build a temple, we could be secure. And if we somehow just follow the laws, in fact, they created other laws outside of what God uh, had, had told them and said, if we follow all of our system, it protects what God wants and makes him happy. And we also have a place where God is. It's this temple right here. And so, you know, we're good. We're good. We could do whatever lifestyle we want, and God can't say anything about it. If you've seen the movie uh, The Departed, it's about, uh, basically it's about uh, a cop who goes deep undercover, and it's about a gangster who goes deep undercover as a cop. And, uh, and so they kind of swap roles. And uh, one of the things I like about it is, is that they, the, the gangster who becomes a cop, he's still actually in you know, the gang, he's in the mafia, and he becomes a cop in order to know the law really well and the ins and outs of what he can get away with. It's almost like that. In their hearts, they still wanted to get away with everything. They still wanted to live the life that they wanted to live. And so they knew the law really, really well. And walking around and saying, well, no, uh, this is holy and it's holy and everything's great. And they're speaking kind of like what we'd speak, like Christianese all the time. But in their hearts, 
They were still toward, they were still turned towards Egypt. They place God in this temple and say, well, as long as, you know, everything happens here, then God's happy and we're good. Insecurities. We build systems when we're insecure. As long as I do all these things, as long as I check these boxes, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good Jew, is what they were thinking. And so when Stephen comes along and he says, hey, there's actually something else, something greater. This, this Christ, the Messiah, has come and it's Jesus and he wants us to turn towards him. Suddenly, that shook their system. That shook their system. And it may sh shake our systems. We have insecurities. It's evidenced uh, all the time. You ever see people who uh, laugh or smile a lot? You ever meet people and they're like, hi, <laughs> I, I don't know why it bothers me sometimes. Uh, you know, I'm like, hi, how are you? And they're like, ha, 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 And I'm like, is there something on my face? Am I a clown? Um, I, I'm sure it is. I'm sure I do have a funny face, but... Uh, it, it's there's some insecurity where I don't know you, I want to be friendly, and right, we, we are all insecure people. We have these triggers that are about us. And sometimes we don't take the, the time to really dig deep into ourselves to see, well, what is really the truth? What is going on? It's much more convenient for us to just build a system. It was much more convenient for these people who are accusing Stephen to say, no, let's build a system, and if anything tries to come around that, we're just going to defend it by saying, this is holy, you can't do that. But Stephen, again, appeals to the past and says, but that's not who God is. You're trying to have it your way. You're trying to put God in a box, and that's not where he belongs. And secondly, you're not even listening to God anyway. You don't like when prophets rise up and say, hey, this is actually an error that's deep in your heart. No, 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 I'm reading through the scripture. It says this. Stephen addresses that. God cannot be contained. The idea was, if God can be bound to a place, it was easier to keep track of him. It's kind of like when you go to a, a restaurant, like an Asian restaurant, and you'll see in the corner, what, a little idol, a little figurine adorned with candles and fruit. I had once almost taken the fruit and got yelled at, <laughs> don't take the fruit. Why is that idol there? I had questioned that when I, I first came into Asian culture. I'm like, well, that, it just angered me because I wanted an orange and, you know, they wouldn't let me take it. But I asked, well, why is it there? And they said, well, they're trying to appease these idols. And the idea is, the system is, if I make sure that this God is happy, then it will bless me and I will continuously have prosperity. That's a system. That's some sort of belief in their mind that, oh, as long as this, and it's something that I can keep track of. It's something that I could keep track of and I can control this idol. If I put idols, if I put that little cat there, right, I will be prosperous. It should be a guarantee. And that is what exactly what these uh, religious leaders were doing. And that's what Stephen called out. He said, you're trying to contain God into one place and build a system around that. But God cannot be contained. And secondly, again, he says you can't keep the law. At an extreme, keeping the law would become something like a works-based religion. That's what the Catholic Church had become in the opening illustration. And Martin Luther called that out. Saying, look, if you just give some money, uh, your sin's released and you're good to go. But what good does that do for your heart? Now, I'm sure there were some people that actually gave and were thinking like, oh, well, you know, I, I'm really sorry, God, and here it is. But the ones in power, that wasn't necessarily what their, their modus operandi was. That wasn't what their motive was. So you can't keep God's law, is what Stephen was saying. You can't even keep it in your heart. Trying to contain God and make it your own. These were the accusations. Now, how do we have it our way today? Because we like to have it your way all the time. I'm convinced that you and I, well, you want to have it your way, and I want to have it my way. How do we do that today? How do we make these systems for ourselves where we say that this is God in a box, and as long as I do these things, God's happy and I'll be blessed and everything as well? How do we do this? Why is it important? Well, it happens in at least two ways. There's things that happen outside of the church, and there's things that happen inside of the church. Outside of the church, here's the popular belief out there. There's a term called secular humanism. Right? It's kind of like relativism. It's your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. See, I can build in my mind what reality is really about, that there's nothing beyond this life. There, and you may be uh, somebody who ascribes to that who's sitting here today. 
listening to this message and thinking, well, yeah, it, real reality is, is just whatever I believe in my mind. If that's true, I, I would be very insecure as a person. If I were sitting here today, if I were sitting there today, believing that all reality is whatever it is that happens in my mind, that's a system that you build. And that, well, as long as you're a good person and everybody's, you know, in agreement with what you do, it's okay. But here's why I would be very insecure. You're never really sure if there is an objective truth. In other words, you're not really sure if your reality is truly what reality really is. What happens when you take your last breath and then you open your eyes on the other side of life and realize that everything is wrong? That's a very scary thing. That's a very scary thing. Most of the arguments that I hear outside of the church, uh, why does God allow bad things to happen? I don't go to church because of all the bad things that the church has done through the years. All of these arguments are actually systems that I've realized that people uh, will start to put into their hearts in order to rationalize away their need for God. Slowly, this country is doing this more and more, and we need to be very vigilant about that. They're starting to take prayer. I mean, they took prayer out of school already. They're they're starting to uh, be very sensitive to what everybody else wants in life. And that's a scary thing. The second thing, the way that we have it our way, so we have this sort of anti-normalism, but the second way inside of the church, we do this. We try to rationalize away our need for God by something called legalism. Again, we're still putting God into a box, but here, here's, here's how the idea is. We lock God into our conception of reality. We don't really allow the word of God to affect our hearts. We know it in our mind. So this is what a lot of Christians will do. You'll memorize your scripture, you'll go through it, and you'll be like, well, I can quote all these ten dozen different scriptures, but you don't actually live it out in your life. You're just building a system to say, well, I, I put lots of bumper stickers on my car, I put all the Bible verses on Facebook, but it hasn't really transformed my life. I know the verses, I could quote them, I can become some sort of uh, spiritual giant or at least appear to be one, but on the inside, you're still spiritually empty. You're trying to keep God in some sort of box. You're creating a system for yourself. And when you do that, when you become more legalistic about things, a scary thing happens. It becomes about performance. And that's exactly what the Catholic Church at the very beginning what I mentioned, what Martin Luther was saying about the Catholic Church is you are making this about works. You are making this about as long as I check all the boxes, as long as I pay the money, as long as I show up on Sunday, as long as I go to small group occasionally, as long as I say I'm praying for people, as long as I got that fish on my car, God must bless me. God bless America. As long as we say that, he'll bless us. But that's not necessarily true. God is not obligated to bless America or you. But we set up this system of security in our minds and in our, and in our daily lives. A scary thing to become a legalist. It was legalists that killed Jesus. It wasn't his followers. It was the ones that thought that they knew the scripture so well. It was the ones that thought that they were keeping up with all the religious practices were the very ones that accused and killed Jesus himself. They're the same ones that are accusing Stephen now here. Think about your life for just a minute. How much do you allow the word of God to really change you and impact you? How much are you following after God? Or is it just, I'm living from Sunday to Sunday, and as long as I show up, that's all that matters. And I'm glad you're here. It's like going to the gym. As long as you're, right? as long as you're at the gym, good. All right, that's a good habit. But the danger of just taking in things for academic purposes, for intellectual experiences, that alone is not going to change you. That alone may change you into a legalist, if anything. But we need to allow the Spirit of God to work in us and through us. How do we do that? How do we be protected from these systems, these sort of thinking of, well, as long as, you know, I think God is everywhere, and so, you know, it doesn't really matter. And the other end, no, God is right there at Tenlei Church. You have to be there from 10.30 to 12 or from 12.30 to 2. How do we protect ourselves from these things? Look at verses 54 through 60, all right? This is the last and uh, the, the final portion of our scripture here. 
When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, verse 54, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. We're going to talk a lot about him in the next few weeks. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he heard this, he fell asleep. When they heard this, of course, they were very angry about it. But what did Stephen do here? What do you see him doing? He's saying, look, he is still, even in the midst of all of this heat, still filled with the Holy Spirit and still looking at Christ as an example and doesn't even blame what's going on. His, his idea of a system, it did not exist. His whole idea was, my system is to look to Jesus all the time. My system is to point people to Jesus all the time. That's my system. Go to God all the time, not just a physical location, not just a set of rules and regulations. I want to follow Christ. And the second, the second principle that we see is that, uh, is that we need, that we need to follow is that we keep assessing what is the truth. We keep, we keep looking back at what scripture says and, and then looking at the reflection in our own lives. That's something that they did not do. What did they do? He said, you stiff necked people. And what did they do? They were still stiff-necked. They didn't want to turn and say, well, maybe he's right. No, they said, nope, I am dead set on the current lifestyle that I am in. In fact, they covered their ears. They didn't even want to hear the truth. Nope, this is what it's about. I'm going to stop here. That's good. I don't want to go deeper. I don't want to learn more about Jesus. The system I got going makes me comfortable. It's predictable. I know how God works now. I understand. And once you think that you understand how God works, that's when you start to mold and manipulate. They were given to angry outbursts. They gnashed their teeth at him because they were shook. They were offended. They were scared. They were threatened. And instead of assessing whether that was really the truth, instead of really listening to what Stephen had to say, Instead of recognizing that their heart was sinful, they did exactly what he said. You have done this through all of your history. You've tried to place God in a box and let your heart just go wild. You've done this over and over. You've killed people that God has raised up. And guess what? God raised up Stephen. He told them the truth and they did the exact same thing. They sealed their own fate, and so did Stephen by saying this. We want it our way. He said, you want it your way. We want it our way. So is there any hope for us then? How do we get over this? How do we stop ourselves or recognize that we're starting to build a system? We're starting to craft our own idol. We're starting to, in our hearts, in the in the in the heart. Uh, in the shop of our heart, right? We're putting a little idol in the corner and putting oranges around that and saying, well, as long as I do this, I'm good. As long as I check all the boxes, I'm good. God has to bless me. Instead of seeking a, 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 a fruitful relationship with Jesus. So is there any way that we could get out of this? Because our hearts are not unlike those religious leaders who killed Stephen. We do want to have it our way. We were told that growing up, have it your way. And we want to do that when we apply that to God. Well, there is. Like Stephen, Jesus addresses both of these things and he frees us from our attempts to place God in a box and have it our way. In John 4, for example, Jesus talking to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. He's already breaking boundaries by doing this. He's a man, she's a woman, she's a Samaritan, he's a Jew from Judea. Right? It was a big thing and they're talking. He's up north. It's kind of like NorCal, SoCal. She says, Sir, the woman said in John 4, 19, I could see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, geographical location, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, 
Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet check it out, verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Jesus, uh, called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you now, am he. Jesus doesn't talk about the where. See, she had this notion, just like these religious leaders, that the place really mattered because that's the whole system. If I go there, I'll be blessed. If I do this, I'll be blessed. And Jesus says, look, that's irrelevant, the place, because the time is coming and has yet now come, where the who is going to matter a whole lot more. And I, God, have come to you now. That's what matters. The place is irrelevant. I am the one that you need to seek. And Jesus brings that directly to her and says, forget about this mountain or that mountain. God needs to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. That's what matters to God. Right? The second thing was the law, right? First thing was the place, the system that's set up by the place and the system that's set up by the law. The second thing, the law, Romans 3.19 talks about the law. It says, now, that, now we know that whatever the law says, it, ha, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. So Paul, later on, writes about the law. And this was a teacher of the law. He understood the law probably better than a lot of these guys who are about to stone Stephen. And Paul himself says, look, the law isn't the thing that's going to make you godly. The law is only there to show you that you can't follow it. So what do we do then? Well, Jesus also talks about this in John 14. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's the law. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I'll ask the Father. He'll give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. That is why it doesn't matter where you worship. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, believer, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus says, obey my commandments. If you love me, the first step. It's not about religion. It's not about a religious system. It's about loving me. It's about coming to me, Jesus. and Obey what I have to say. I will give you the Spirit. He will be the one that's going to guide you. He's going to be the one that will walk through you. I'll walk with you through life. That's what matters. So the law, keeping the law, yeah, the law is there. That's God's word saying, hey, this is how good I need you to be. This is, and you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to check off all the lists. Why? Because your heart is the problem. But Jesus says, hey, love me. Come to me. Love me. I'll give you the spirit. We set up these systems. We set up these systems when really it's just a lot of work for nothing. Our sole purpose is to constantly look to Christ and to point others in that direction. Right? You want to have it your way. We want to focus on having it his way and allowing him, Jesus Christ, to dominate in our lives. And if you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, I'd like to invite you to invite him into your heart. He's there. And guess what? He'll still be there when you get home. He's with us all the time. So we can worship him in spirit and in truth. It's great. We should come together like this. We should. But we recognize that he's not just here. He's with us all the time if we call ourselves believers in Jesus Christ. And that he will help fulfill uh, who we are supposed to be fully. He will give us that sense of security if we continue to follow him. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks for this day, Lord. We give you thanks and praise for your word. We give you thanks for Stephen and his sacrifice, for standing up 
in tough times, when people are shook, when they're saying, hey, it's about a religion, when they're offended because your word may pierce through their hearts and hit their core, Lord. Lord, in the same way, when we hear your word, forgive us, because so often we want to deflect it, we want to try to rationalize it away. I pray that as we do hear your word over and over, that you will convict us, that we will not just cover our ears and scream and say, no, it's not true, but that we will look to you and assess our hearts and see if that is of you or not. Father God, will you cast out all of these idols and these systems that we build in our hearts and our minds, where we can try to manage it, where we can try to play God? Will you forgive us of all of those times that we have done that? And will you purify us, Lord Jesus? I, the one speaking to you, I am he, you said to that woman, Lord. You are the one that frees us. You are the one that guides us. You are the one who will always be with us, no matter where we are. So I pray that you will bless my brothers and sisters here, that we will go out, not only looking to you all the time, but to point others to look at you as well in our lives. We give you thanks for this time in Christ's name. A few announcements for us. VBS, yep, go ahead. <laughs> it was a little shy there. VBS decorations, June 5th. Uh, oh, it's tomorrow. It's, is it tomorrow? That is tomorrow. At 11 a.m. Hmm. It is tomorrow at 11 a.m. If you are free, please come decorate at 11 a.m. tomorrow. No, that's actually something we really need. Uh, we like to turn the whole thing into a big, you know, for when the kids come, you know, they're, they're like excited and it's not just like, you know, I mean, this is cool too, but I mean, they want to see like animals and stuff like that. So please come and help if you're available. Uh, VBS staff training. Yeah. Uh, if you are signed up, how many are signed up for VBS? It's coming up in June. Awesome. You need to be here. If you have a hand raised, then June 11th is when you're coming out. Uh, it's going to be right here after service. Uh, that's next week, uh, right after service. Okay. Uh, so you need to be here for that training, please. And join Father's Day. Yes, there's a Father's Day service and barbecue, 1030. Okay, that's for everybody. Uh, we're going to worship with the daddies, and then uh, we're going to make them barbecue. <laughs> it's it's kind of funny. Like Mother's Day, you know, we cook, and then Father's Day, the fathers still cook. So, But um, because they cook really good. So uh, 1030, it's going to be uh, uh, together here, okay, at uh, on Father's Day. I think that's the 7th. 17th, is that right? Yeah, June 17th. Cool. 18th, 18th. Okay, that one too. Uh, oh, it's right there. There you go. And uh, mission team is collecting donation items for July 1st. It's what? 8th. 8th. Jeremiah, are you in charge of that? No. Can you, can you tell us a little about that? St stand up. Stand up and speak loudly. Can you guys hear him over there? Okay, come up here. Just come up here. Just, this, is a, this is a device which amplifies the voice. Okay, so on uh, July 8th, on Saturday here at TLC, um, we're partnering up with uh, Savers where they have this huge, humongous scale where we collect um, different items and they weigh um, the items uh, depending like what type they're, what, what kind of items they are. So it could be clothing, books, and um, as they're measuring, they calculate um, the, they calculate by how much pound, like the weight by pounds, and then they'll give us a, a donation amount based off um, the items. So. Um, what, would, what would help for both the Cambodia and Peru team is that you guys collect the items and you bring it to um, church here uh, the week of the, um, the, for the savers, and then uh, that's when we'll just collect everything. So, yeah. Um, clothing, books. Um, Weights, bricks, you know. <laughs> like, just items that you guys don't use. So, any, any, anything that, furniture, computers, whatsoever, so. Yeah. Cinder blocks, you know. Yeah. We need the weight. <laughs> Just the weight. All right, useful household items, et cetera. Okay, don't bring weights and bricks. <laughs> that's, clothes, books, uh, that's good to know. So clean out, spring cleaning, bring it there. It's going to help out our mission teams to, uh, to get it on July 8th. <laughs> wow, that, that switched. Okay, uh, <laughs> very quickly. Uh, anything else? Any other announcements we got? Steve, S Stefan? Oh, no, nothing? Okay. Hey, let's, let's pray for these items. Holy God, again, we, we give you thanks uh, for a time that we could come together uh, and just celebrate what you're doing. 
uh, in the community, celebrate what you're doing in, in our lives, and celebrate the victory that we have in, in Jesus Christ and the hope that we have. Lord, we, we want to spread that hope and that joy and that uh, transforming power into this community. So I pray that you'll uh, empower uh, the leaders and the staff and even those uh, that are coming to to decorate uh, as an offering to you, Lord, just, you know, their time to sacrifice, to come out, just to put up, um, you know, put up silly things so that will delight these uh, these kids' hearts and that will really amplify the experience for them uh, so that they understand uh, more about about you, Lord, and, and feel comfortable and feel that there is a place uh, called a sanctuary where they can be safe and learn about uh, Christ Jesus. So I pray for those staff members and those who are coming to give their time to help uh, tomorrow and and, uh, and to give their time for the week of VBS, Lord, we pray that you'll prepare their hearts, give strength to Kevin and to Priscilla and to, to others who are uh, putting together the VBS, Lord, uh, in this community. We pray for our mission team. We pray that uh, we'll, we'll be able to raise the funds, not only that, but to gather some items that can benefit other people as well. Um, but we pray that uh, we'll be able to raise the funds to uh, send out our missionaries, uh, not just here locally, but all over the world, uh, to, to see what you're doing. Um, in in the lives of our brothers and sisters overseas, Lord, and uh, we we give you thanks for uh, all of all of the things that are happening, all of the uh, of the of the wonderful things that we're seeing uh, through your Spirit uh, happen here. So I pray that you'll you'll be in them, that you'll bless them, and that you'll open our eyes to to what you're doing, Lord. We give you thanks for this day in Christ's name, Amen. If you'd all rise, I'd like to send you out with a blessing. Put out your hands as a posture of receiving. May you go, church, knowing that your God goes with you wherever you go, that you may worship in spirit and truth. Go in peace. Amen.